Call a regular meeting of the New Alm City Council for September 19, 2017, 4.30 p.m. to order. First item on the agenda is your consent agenda items. What's your wishes? I'll offer a motion to approve those. Second. We got a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items. Any discussion on any? Seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Uh, item number 2A, I think we'll skip that and bring that up at the end if it's okay with everybody else as the last item. So we'll go on item 2B, conduct a public hearing to consider a request on the Green Mill Best Western Plus at 2101 South Broadway for a noise variance to allow live bands to perform in the parking lot during the Rock October Fest. Rock Rock October, Rock October Fest. Fest. There we go. October Fest and outside the event during the weekend of October Fest. Weekends. I'm sorry about that. That's a public hearing. Anybody like to be heard on it? Seeing none. Entertain a motion. I'll offer a motion to close the public hearing and pass all objections. Or yeah, this is worded different. Um, I'll offer a motion to <coughs> close the public hearing and, and move forward on the request. Second. We got a motion to second off resolution. Ways of reading, closing the public hearing and the no unauthorized noise variance. And the dates for those are October 6th, uh, 730 to 1130, the 7th from 4 to 1130, Friday, October 13th from 730 to 1130, Saturday, October 14th from 4 to 11.30. We didn't hear anything in writing or any complaints from any neighbors? Okay. No? No other questions, comments? Finance Director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schultz? Yes. Motion carries. Item 2C, conduct a public hearing on a petition for improvements on the alley in Block 185 north of Center Street. Steve? Mr. President, the city has received a petition for improvements on the alley in Block 185 North of Center Street. 75.4% um, of the adjacent property owners signed the petition. I have not received any uh, written or verbal comments regarding this public hearing. With that being said, they had 75% signing. I'll move to offer the resolution. Way to reading findings of the petition. Closing the public hearing, order of improvements and the preparation of plans and specs for the alley in Block 185 North of Center Street. I'll second that. We got a motion and second to offer the resolution. Waived reading. Any more discussion? We went really quick. Just want to make sure there's nobody in the audience that wants to be heard on that. Okay. I'll make sure. No more comments? Finance Director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmidt? Yes. Motion carries. Item 2D, conduct a public hearing to consider a resolution approving which conditions the final plat of Milford Heights second edition located in flat part of lot one, block two, fifth North Street, first edition. Public hearing, anybody like to be heard? I'll offer a motion to close the public hearing, offer resolution, waive the reading, improving the conditions, the final plat of Milford Heights, second edition, located part of lot one, block two, fifth North Street, first edition. Second. We got a motion to second off the resolution and waive the reading. Any more discussion? So we include the conditions as well that are stated. Correct. No more? Finance Director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmitz? Yes. Motion carries. Item 3A, consider motion approving the issuance of annual on-sale intoxicating liquor license and transfer to annual on-sale intoxicating on Sunday liquor license for 225 North Minnesota Street 
the LLC. I'll offer the motion. Second. We got a motion and a second. Any discussion? <laughs> President, uh, the Safety Commission uh, considered a request from New Elm Area Catholic Schools submitted uh, by Shelley Bauer requesting some on-street parking modification signage. Uh, most of the requested uh, items have to do with shifting around some existing parking uh, conditions and uh, the hope that they can get their buses and off-street parking to flow a little bit better. Um, the Safety Commission recommended that the improvements or that the recommend or the requested modifications be approved. Ms. Bauer is here if you have any questions regarding her request. Anybody got any questions? Are you picking it up? He's fine. Oh. Do we have any <coughs> understanding of when there, these are be implemented? Uh, Mr. President, if the City Council uh, uh, passes this by resolution, the street, can, the street Department would start working on, on the uh, modifications as soon as possible. We'll have to do some one calls and things like that before they put posts in the ground. I did discuss it with Mr. Curry from the uh, Public Works Department and he had no issues with the request. I'll offer the resolution to waive the reading and authorize the modifications. I'll second. We got a motion and a second to offer resolution, waive the reading. Any more discussion? Seeing none. Finance director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmitz? Yes. Motion carries. Item 4B, number one, consider motion approving the task force order number 2015-1 for the airport engineering services to meet and hunt professional services contract. Steve? Mr. President, uh, this is a continuation of some I an item that was acted upon by the uh, council at the previous council meeting where they approved the uh, federal grant offer to fund this particular <coughs> project. We've got a uh, uh, airport master plan that's 41 years old that needs to be updated as, long, as well as the airport layout plan and a zoning update. We work with the uh, regional FAA office and the Minnesota Office of Aeronautics to uh, develop this task order. And it's been uh, submitted by Meet and Hunt, just under 290,000. Between the state and uh, uh, federal government, they'll be paying about 95% of the cost. So if you have any particular questions, I could attempt to answer it. It's a rather lengthy document, but it has been reviewed by both those agencies and myself as well as an outside consultant. Just in reading the request, it, it, the cost to the city is about $24,000, so that's our 5% about. Uh, yes, Mr. President, it's a little bit confusing because the uh, state and federal government will pay 95% of the cost of the master plan update and ALP update, and the state will pay 80% of the zoning update, which is about, this is a small portion of that. And according to your documents, this is in the 2018 budget request. So I'm assuming this bill will come out next year. That is correct. Okay. So with that, I'm going to offer the motion. Second. Second. We need a report. We got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item 4B, number two. Consider a resolution to establish <coughs> a joint airport zoning board. Steve? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, after we've 
or after you have approved the zoning update and the grant can fund the zoning update will be shortly. Um, we'll need to establish the a joint airport zoning board, which consists of entities that uh, the airport touches or uh, may affect, which would be the city of New Ulm, Brown County, and Milford Township. So um, it's kind of a lengthy process. There is kind of a outline of how to get there attached to uh, your request for council action form. But I will be working with uh, Mead and Hunt if it's approved and of course the city attorney to uh, get through this process and we can report back to you as we move along. Thank you. Any questions, concerns? and a second off resolution waive the reading. Any more discussion? Seeing none, finance director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmidt? Yes, motion carries. Item, item <coughs> number 5A, consider a motion to reauthorize the negotiations with the Farmers Co-op of Hanska and Plaza and Plumbing and Heating for land acquisitions or easements for a non-motorized trail along the Minnesota River between Park Street and 3rd North Street. Tom? Thank you, President Schmitz and Councilors. You have before you a request to uh, reopen discussions with the Farmers Co-op of Hanska and Klaus and Plumbing for a potential trail segment along the Minnesota River between Riverside Park and Minicon Park. Um, you had authorized this in the past, and, and also for an application for legacy grant, and we, are, we were awarded that and created the design, um, but we weren't quite able to deliver that project before the state deadline, so we returned the $100,000 grant um, due to a lack of control over the land um, in question here, uh, owned by Clausen Plumbing and Farmers Co-op of Hanska. We weren't able to consummate a, an easement or uh, purchase, and um, there's been some time between then and now and uh, change in management. And I think it's an appropriate time to um, go back to the table and see if we can um, get an easement or acquire land for this trail segment. Thank you. Anybody have any questions, concerns for Tom? Just a comment that it was unanimously, unanimously voted on to recommend the proposed action at the September 11th Can we pull up some of the maps so we can let the public see what we're looking at? Is that possible? Nope. Um, Not possible. They're in the packet. I don't right. know if... Uh, it's in the packet for us, but not in the packet for the public. Yeah. I don't know if NewCat can do that. You um, can put it on... If you have it there, you can put it right there, and it'll pull it up off of your screen, I believe, right? Is that right, Ron? Turn on your overhead, then you should be able to pull it up right here. Or maybe not. Can you turn on this camera, Ron? I had it on earlier. Is it coming off the ceiling? Yep, it comes right down on the ceiling, right onto what you're looking at. You put your paper there, and we're getting used to this new building, by the way, for the next six weeks. So thank you to our new public. More. Kind of show us what we're more. looking at. More, more, <laughs> almost there. Keep turning. <laughs> you should have a. Ice there cream. you go. Perfect. There we go. All right. You can uh, point right on your screen there. Certainly, this is basically Center Street here, Center Street and Third North. See the elevators. Uh, they go Hanska elevators and Plaza Plumbing right here. 
So that's a strip we would need to go to negotiate. Yes, because we own or have control over and the that, other how land. How long is that, approximately? And that would only be a couple of blocks. Like two blocks, okay. Mm -hmm. Tom, is that considered a road currently? No. no. <laughs> it's just a it's trail? A, it's a cart path that was designated for, I think, unloading of boats and things of that nature way back when, but we don't have any legal right to that cart path. It still stays with the prop underlying property owner as the city attorney, back when we originally did this, uh, had noted. So is the negotiation the width of a um, car width or is it a lot wider than, how much are we looking at? Typical trail right of way, nice. I think it's about 12 feet, 12, feet? 12 to okay. 15 feet. You know, and that's just another segment of uh, kind of a Minnesota River Parkway master plan concept. You know, other segments of trail would include uh, through Riverside Park and then from 3rd North upriver into Minicon Park, coming out Minicon Drive, hooking into our existing trail system. Just another segment of a multi-segmented system. Do we have a guesstimate on dollar amount this is going to eventually cost the city if we go forward on this? No, that's why I'm that's requesting authorization to get back to the table and talk with the two private landowners. I, I guess we really don't have anything to lose, just to reauthorize right. negotiation, come back. If they say no, drop. If they say yes, the grant will probably come back to council to put into the grant and whatnot. So right. yeah. motion to reauthorize negotiations with Farmers Club of Hanscom and cost I'll second that. I guess I have another question. We got question. a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, do have, I do have another question. Um, the $100,000 legacy grant, so that was sent back. So did we reapply? What? President Schmitz, Councilor Fisher, Councilors, we have not reapplied for the grant, and I will not recommend we do so until we have control of the land that we're desiring to put the trail upon. This is step one. Correct. And then how much, is it a matching grant? Um, yes. Normally these park and trail legacy grants are a matching grant. So now we'd be talking at least $100,000 that the park and rec would have to match. At this point, President Schmitz, we, you know, we have no idea on those details and, um, you know, we'll be having to relook at the scope of work whether we're going to go just for this segment <coughs> or I thought the last grant was $100,000. Um, it was a $100,000 grant from the state, and then our match um, was, I think, getting up into the $75,000 range as we got closer to potential construction. You know, construction estimates increased as that, um, as we got closer to to that, but we never consummated land control for that segment of the trail. So the project was shelved. We had anticipated that that section would have to be built heavier, correct? For yes, farmers yes, we have the, correct. We have the design that we made back then, um, and that segment was beefed up um, with the anticipation that the co-op might be bringing large trucks back there, you know, grain trucks. But at this point, we just want to get back to the table and have those discussions with those two private landowners to see what possibilities exist. And then there will be other phases of uh, going through park commission and council as far as design, scope of work, grant application, and so on. So I drove down there the other day actually before I even know this was an agenda item. And uh, I drove behind there. I don't know, my opinion is, is, and I'm always opinionated, I think it's a waste of money. I just, I cannot see a trail going behind there. There's nothing there. It's just a dirt trail. And Minicon, we haven't done nothing with Minicon. It's gonna, you know, and you're, you're tying 
Riverside Park up to something that's nothing yet. So why do we want to spend all that money? You know, it just to me it don't make sense. We have other things that we should be spending money on in the Parks Department besides the trail down there. We, I was just at a meeting where you were the other day. We're sitting down there with a building that we don't even heat in the winter because we're worried about money. I mean, we're only talking a thousand dollars, and here we want to spend a hundred thousand dollars. Sorry, we don't have sidewalks down there. For every place else in town, we have sidewalks. Why don't we get Riverside Park to where it should be before we spend money tying things together to nowhere? President Schmitz, we have many elements of park development, proposed park development at Riverside Park and Minicon Park. You know, recently we were, we were able to complete the replacement and upgrade of the water access site at Minicon with a quarter million dollar grant from the state of Minnesota. And there's many different elements. I'm happy to sit down with you and go over these different um, aspects of improvement at Riverside Park and uh, well, I, Minicon Park. I agree to river access, that, that makes sense. But to me, some of it doesn't make sense. I mean, that, that's for activity for on the river. There's nothing but a mosquito haven back there. There's really, I don't see a future in the river. I mean, if you want to leave something grow wild enough, that would be a good spot to start from. It is. Is there a hope at some point to connect this trail with other trails as well through the city? Yes, it's a segment of our existing trail and potential future trails. Right. Um, about they all connecting in the next Yes, year. including, you know, potentially the Putting Green site at 20th South, the former Putting Green site with, with Front Street on top of our, the city-owned berm would be another segment of uh, scenic trail along our mighty Minnesota River. So we're going to build a non-motorized trail, beef it up so they can drive semis on. Those details have not been worked out yet. <laughs> and uh, Maybe we'll get to we know what's going to come. Teacher, whatever. But. Tom, do we have any concerns about the flooding in the rear? In regards to that? The or river raise it? Water levels Start raise working. and they re you know, uh, re rescind. Um, Bolton and Mink, the engineers that prepared the plan, they were confident that. It's parallel with the flow of the river, and that this trail segment would not be washed out because of that. Similarly, you know, the water access site, the parking lot, the lower parking lot at Minicon Park has been underwater numerous times with no known damage to it. So you can design, build uh, anything to withstand. And, you know, if being that this proposed <coughs> trail segment is parallel with the flow of the river, that's a big plus from an engineering standpoint. But it will flood. Oh yes, absolutely. So that's gonna, just like the lower parking lot, the water access site at Minicon. Yeah. The lower uh, grass area of Riverside Park floods. So why you want to build that trail that Kitty Corners cockeyed down through the park, why don't you just go straight down around the river there too? The Riverside Park proposed trail would be up out of the high water mark. It would be kind of mid shelf was the design that we created a few so years back. This in the water. Pardon? We're putting this in the water mark. Yeah, because we don't want to go through the uh, the elevators, you know, um, or up along Front Street. We like to provide scenic enjoyment of um, the nature and the Minnesota River. And Burdick is scenic. Uh -huh. <laughs> My sense word, whatever. Anybody else comments? Is there other pla places where you, where there's other trails um, in the future plan that might benefit more than putting our money in a trail that might be flooded part of the year? Is, you know, is there other expansions other than this area? Well, other than this segment from, you know, 3rd North to Park Street, uh, we have a proposed, well, we actually have a design through Riverside Park from Center Street to actually Park Street to 3rd South. Um, and now there's been discussions with the Minnesota River Group about an interest in um, a trail uh, on the south terminus of Front Street 
down to 20 a solid um, on top of the berm, and that's designed not to flood. So there's just a number of just segment ideas that could take decades to complete, cl completely build out a system. But this is an opportunity to further enjoy um, the Minnesota River and its, and its uh, you know, scenic values. And I get that. I, I, I <coughs> think people would enjoy riding along the river rather than on a, you know, through the, any industrial area or, or whatever. I just worry about the flooding and the access to that. Presently, uh, people are using that corridor and traversing that corridor, um, you know, on a regular basis. Uh, granted, they're trespassing on the private property segment but uh, I, every time I go down there, I see people down there uh, fishing, angling, um, skipping stones, uh, parents, children, grandparents, multi-generational experience um, you know, on the river. Not everyone has a boat. A lot of people like to shore fish and, and uh, enjoy the scenery along a shoreline. One other comment, you just get an item that is not a part of this, but just before we do anything with the berms, research prior council meetings, I almost could swear in the building of the berms that we said never going to be trails on top of a berm in anybody's backyard. We sure had discussions. I can't remember if we voted on that. Uh, I know we discussed. I've done I discussed. I just, I've done like, some research. Yeah. Where's, and, the, where's you know, Dennis when you need him? We, we own that southern portion of the you berm. We own it, but we, I, I think, I'll be up front right now, I will not support it. I don't think we should be doing that in anybody's backyard. <coughs> Sorry. There, Sorry. There was discussion about not <coughs> putting it on the land. We just had easements for the berm on because those individuals own their property and mm -hmm. uh, they weren't going to give us easement if we allowed that. But on our, the own section, <coughs> we had always talked about, uh, you know, with the city council and with staff, that that could be utilized by the city for any purposes. The, I think the problem is, I think, uh, I think Mr. Kaler would say that, you know, we don't want vehicles, you know, running up there unless they're for the, for the maintenance vehicles and stuff like that, but walkers and, and bicyclists would be a problem. I mean, from a, the berm perspective, mm -hmm. maybe it's a problem for the people that uh, live on Front Street and, and then have traffic back there, but it's actually past their backyard across the alley and across the city-owned property, so it's actually quite a ways away from the house, but that's a decision for the right. council, whether they want to allow that or not. Mm -hmm. It's not <laughs> staff's decision, that's your decision. Well, that's not the action in front of us right, right. now. Exactly. Here, so we should move on. We got a long night. Any more discussion on 5 a.m.? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Finance Director, call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmidt? Nope, motion carries. Item number 5B, number one and two. Consider ordinance amending section 9.04 of the city code of the city of New Alm relative to zoning of said city. Second read of ordinance number 17-016, fifth series, and a motion to adopt ordinance number 17-016, fifth series. Roger. I'll offer a motion to waive oh. the second reading of this ordinance we have a really long one coming up um, and I'll include the motion to adopt this ordinance 17 016 fifth series Second. this just has to do with some zoning so. we got a motion and a second any more discussion say or not all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Polls, no carries item 5c number one and two considered ordinance amending section 9.04 of the city code city of new Ulm relative to zoning of said city second reading of ordinance number 
on seven fifth series and a motion to adopt ordinance number 17 017 fifth series i'll be nice again and offer a motion to waive the second reading of this ordinance and to offer a motion to adopt 17 017 fifth series again it has to do with some zoning issues in our city unless somebody really wants me to read it or roger read it no, second. no hands up no hands went up we got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item number 5D. Consider a resolution. Was that a resolution? Yep. Was it a resolution? Yep. What is it? No. 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 Yeah, I really think we're amending um, or enacting an ordinance. I think it'd be appropriate to do it by resolution. Let's see. Both of them? D and C? Or just C? They both kind of the same. Right? Yeah, I know. Did we, was the last one, was that a motion as well? It was a motion, yeah. Okay. We can do them both. All right. You want to, I would suggest let's, you do it okay. by resolution. Do you want to do this one first? Let's do 5D. We'll go back. So All right, then I'll just offer mine as a resolution versus a. Motion. Second. We got a motion and a second off resolution. We'll be reading. Any more discussion? Seeing none, finance director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmitz? Yes. Motion carries. Item 5C, also a resolution. I'll offer a resolution again, too. So does the motion, basically stating the same thing. Second. We got a motion and a second off resolution. We'll be reading. Any more discussion? Seeing none, finance director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmitz? Yes, motion carries. Item 5D, <coughs> consider resolution approving the First Amendment of the post-closing recommendation for the access agreement with the Minnesota Strauss LLC for the property located at 103 and 123 South Minnesota Street. Three so, members. Uh, Mr. President, I think uh, just for information, the <clears throat> agreement that you have in the council packet uh, has been amended. You have an additional on your uh, laptop, additional icon on the front that you can click on, which shows the red line version. So if you just minimize hit the little dash mark, you'll come up. see the uh, you'll see the one mm -hmm. that has red marked yeah red ink on it mm -hmm. and that's the updated one so you can see all the uh, changes that have been made to it they're, they'll not as I understand it the city attorney will probably explain to you that they're more uh, <coughs> minor doesn't change the substance Mr. President, that's correct. Um, I can also advise the council that uh, I've received communication, uh, Mr. Schnobrick and I today, from the attorney representing the developer. Uh, they've accepted the terms of the agreement with the revisions that we've put in. Uh, we also got input from our consultant, Brown Intertech. And what this is doing, I think primarily considering the amount of time that's elapsed from when the first agreement was signed um, until today, it sounds like the developer is actually gonna move forward with the project, and we needed to finalize this to confirm what the, how the costs would be allocated between the developer and the city. This was some land that the developer acquired. There were some issues with respect to remediating some hazardous waste, and as part of the terms when that was acquired, the city agreed to part, cover part of that cost. So we have two agreements, one just dealing with the fact that it's got to get cleaned up, a second that dealt with how the cost was going to be handled, and at the developer's request, they want to just consolidate them into one agreement, which is what this does. So that's the purpose of it. Any more discussion? Well, with no more discussion, I'll offer the resolution, waive the reading, approving the First Amendment to the post-closing remediation of access agreement with Minnesota Strassi LLC for the property located at 103 to 123 South Minnesota Street. Second. We 
got a motion and a second to offer a resolution. Way of reading. Any more discussion? Mr. President, I, I just point out the, the very first paragraph on page two should be paragraph G as it follows paragraph E and F on the preceding page. Okay. Typo. Discussion? Finance Director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmidt? Yes. Motion carries. Item 6A, consider a resolution approving the development agreement with S&P Development LLC for the property to be platted at Milford Heights Second Edition. I'll offer the resolution we have the reading. Second. Second. We got a motion and a second off resolution. Wave reading. Any more discussion? I think they've talked us to that. Okay. Finance Director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. President Schmidt? Yes. Motion carries. Item 6B, consider a motion to fund a historical video, video for the new fire department as well as startup fund for logo items for the upcoming 150th anniversary celebration in 2020. I think we should hear about this. Who would like to speak? You knew that was coming, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, President Schmitz and council members. Uh, yes, we are seeking a startup fund for our celebration coming up in 2020. Uh, the reason we are asking so early is, um, as you know, uh, flying buttress they're wanting to start the creation of the video fairly early, um, as well as some of the items that we would like to have um, our logo on. Um, we're looking at some commemorative steins and uh, working with someone in New Alm. It takes about a year and a half for her to complete those. So um, part of that is the reason we're asking two years in advance. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. In advance of the... In advance yeah. and throughout the year of 2020, yes. So the budget you're asking for is that, I mean, how do you plan to break up that 15,000? Um, those were in the attachments. We have um, a logo that we need to have created. We have um, prices for commemorative steins. We were looking at um, glassware. Um, and then also um, Flying Buttress doing a commemorative video. And that video is also going to be used for yes. hiring. Yes. Involved. The video, um, we're hoping to create a timeless piece that will not only celebrate 150 years for the Norm Fire Department, but also be used in the future for recruitment um, going forward. And I see we must have a recruitment <coughs> issue because there's been some ads in the paper. Yes, we are looking so for volunteers right as we speak. How many are you looking for? As many as we can get. Okay. Not <laughs> plug time. A question um, on the revenue then taken in on these items, will that go back into what fund? Because that would probably go back to the general fund to the fire department. Yeah. So do, you th do we think we can offset that 15000 That's our goal. I'm confident. <laughs> the one comment I have to make, I do remember 25 years ago, the past council, we did something similar, asked for upfront cost when we did our 125th. And Correct. We didn't have any complaints from mm -hmm. the council. Mm -hmm. It went over pretty good. But it was similar then 25 years ago. <coughs> so then you would support it. <laughs> I think they got two years yeah. to get this rock and roll, and I, I feel real good about this, so I'm going to offer the motion. I'll second that. We got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? I just, going through the items that you have planned, um, I think you've got a good start, and it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you. So at some point, we'd like you to come back and talk more about what's coming and <laughs> get some good publicity for your programs and projects. Certainly. Okay. Thank you. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no? Motion carries. Item 6C, 
consider a resolution accepting the preliminary, or the, yeah, 2018 budget yeah. for the city of New Orleans and establishes the maximum t property tax levy for the 2018 and set a public date to consider the 2018 budget. Okay. Cool. Short yeah. and sweet. <laughs> Mr. President, counselors, <laughs> citizens, this budget here is, is, or the presentation I have here is, is fairly high level. It doesn't get down to the details in all the departments. But if you have questions as I go or as we start discussions, feel free to ask. Um, this budget assumes just a few changes in 2017 from what we've been doing in 2016, and I'll highlight those within the presentation. The preliminary levy amount has to be set by October 2nd, so hopefully we'll come out tonight with that direction, and then once that is set, we'll only be able to lower that come the final budget in December. So. And some of these slides are a little different than what was sent out because I received some information after this was published so I'll explain that as we go here so this is the most update up to date all right so starting with the revenue local government aid of course is one of our largest revenues and one of our biggest supports there is actually a 50,000 almost $60,000 increase in that in the local government aid this year brings it up to 4.3 million and then I just added a little bit of extra history there so you can see where that's been since 2007. Overall, the expenses did decrease 4.4 million in this budget over last year's budget. Basic, or in 2017, we budgeted a large amount for land purchases, um, security upgrades, phone system upgrades, some different things. Those were all budgeted to use fund balance. So the decrease in expenses doesn't translate into a decrease in the levy but there was a decrease of about 18.8%. And then in 2016, there was a spike too, and that was also a large use of fund balance. Um, and most of that was used to pay off um, some debt early. The 2008, 7, 8, and 10 um, bonds were all paid off early, as well as the fire truck was purchased that year. So there was a spike in the expenses for 16. Okay, some of the biggest highlights are the increase <coughs> that really impacted the, the levy that we've come up with health insurance. There is a 12% increase in our health insurance premiums this year, which translates into about $157,000. Now, part of that increase is due to additional staff being added. That would be the assistant city manager, um, another investigator at the PD, and there'll be another part-time position, but that wouldn't affect the health insurance. Over, overall, the personnel services did increase about almost $500,000, or 5.56%. That includes a 2.5% wage increase across the board, um, those additional employees that were mentioned, an increase in the health insurance, and then that related taxes and, and other benefits that go up with the salary. There's an increase of about 20.8% in the IT support. And this, um, as was explained to me, relates mostly to cybersecurity, the needs to increase it, the needs for additional support to make sure we're getting what we need out of what we have. I'm sure you all see the news every day and understand why we would need cybersecurity increases. Nicole, before you move on on the health insurance, I think we probably have to get a different slide. Are we continuing to look at um, different plans for different employees? And because some some employees want one of the lowest prices possible, higher deductible. Some want the opposite. Are we offering a wide variety? Remind me what we're offering for plans. We are adding this year the, um, an HSA option. Um, so input will maintain the plans that we have in place and then add the HSA option for employees that do that. It doesn't change our premiums and doesn't change what goes into that expense. It just creates more benefits or more options for the employee. Um, if we had taken a higher increase than that, we more than likely would have gone out for bids for other plans and other companies. We were comfortable with this budgeted increase. Um, like I said, How often do we go out for bids? Only as needed. It would depend on the market, on the premium increases. And so there's a 20% increase, for example, we would go out for a bid. And we've been with the service co op for three years? Three years now? So we, we, you know, we don't want to jump ship and, and uh, change plans often. That doesn't play well for us when we do go out. So that played into the decision this, well, this year as well. But I do know once every three years or so you do go out for bids, sometimes you can get current companies to drop price because they don't want to lose you either. So 
Right, there's been a lot of negotiation to get it to the 12%. Uh, they actually had it higher, and uh, we had plugged in 12% in anticipation, mm -hmm. and that's where we got it negotiated down to. Okay. The, uh, if you remember last year, it was supposed to be like 46%, oh, and we got it knocked down to 26%. Right. Okay. Uh, so they did a really nice thing for us last year by reducing, because we did warrant a 46% increase. Uh, so we felt that uh, the, the 12, based on other communities that are getting the same kind of bumps, was kind of a realistic number. The calculation for the, the current program we're under, they go back 24 months, <coughs> which includes bad experience <coughs> and some recent good experience. Probably could have went out on the market and just went to the last 12 months, looked at that, and then it had been a very favorable experience. But our third party administrator and staff felt that uh, jumping because of that uh, wasn't probably in our best interest. So we decided let's go this year, and if we see something different next year, you know, it goes up a lot, then we'll likely go out to go out on the market and see if there's something out there that uh, won't increase as high. But, so all of those considerations were made and... Uh, yeah, 12 percent's really, I hate to say 12 percent's not bad. It's right. probably 20 years ago that been horrific, but it's not bad. Well, there, uh, there are some people that we've, uh, <clears throat> that have gone out and said, you know, they're looking at 60, 70 oh. percent increases okay. this year. So. We felt 12 wasn't too bad. Right. right. Thank you. And then the last added, ex or not should last, added expense, but large one that was added was the addition of public safety and lighting, um, about 304000 305000 This is an expense that the PUC has taken, it took on when, when government aid was cut, and they're asking us to take it back. So this expense will actually have an offsetting revenue. in their meter fee and then another fee added to the bills that will be designated specifically for this public safety lighting and the revenue will directly offset the expense. So there's no tax increase related to the, to the lighting. And then looking at the levy, so right now as the levy sits, I, um, I know when it was sent out we were at four and a quarter, but the extra information I received were actually up to an increase of about 375000 or 528 Well, the debt service levy has actually gone down a couple hundred thousand dollars since last year due to those some of those early payoffs that we did in 16. And I will, uh, Go ahead. You want to, uh, I will uh, touch on that what the extra percent was that was added as we go here. Could you go back uh, to the public safety lighting? I just want to note for the city council that <clears throat> this is actually a city fee that will be found on the utility bill. So it's not a PUC fee. It's um, it's kind of it's, it's kind of like your your property taxes. You get your recycling is on that property tax. You got to pay it for it somehow. And they figured the county property tax would be the way to go with that. Uh, this will help reduce the rate uh, that the PUC people will actually see. It'll show up on the bill as a as a fee that's in essence is going to go to the city. And we, in turn, then will pay for our electric usage. Uh, most cities pay for their own electric usage. Like all the Excel customers, you know, the cities they pay for their electric. It was in eighty, uh, no, yeah, two thousand two, two thousand three, when local government aid got cut so drastically that the PUC helped us out, so we wouldn't have to, you know, cut services uh, so dramatic. And now that we're kind of back on the. Asked us to look at this, and we said, "Well, it makes sense." But taking three hundred thousand uh, dollars and putting it on the taxes, you know, you're you're talking about four uh, percent. Is that what it is? Four times it'd be two hundred eighty thousand. So uh, you're talking about a four percent increase in property taxes. And so we figured out that we can keep the property taxes down, just get the fee 
and we'll work it accounting wise so that everything works out. Uh, but it's the city's fee that's on that bill. Much like the water and sewer, uh, water main and, and sewer main fee that's on there, they collect it and they give it to the city. That's at, uh, is that that 350 or 375 number, Steve? Do you remember? I believe it's three, gonna be 375 per yeah. meter sewer and water. Yeah, yeah, each. So it's not nothing new. But it, I just want to make sure everybody's understanding that, that this is what this number is all about. So I know we have more discussion coming, but could we do half this year and half next year? Or half in 18, half in 19? I mean, is that an option? I don't know if we need it, but I just want to throw it we, we We were talking about that process if it was going to be put on the taxes. Right. You know, to ramp it up. Well, it's not going on the taxes. It's just going to be a, a fee on utilities. A lot of people, it's, that's a tax. Yeah, it's a kind of a hidden tax. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Either way, you're paying it. Right. Yeah. No, so it, just, it will be an exchange is actually what it's going to be because it will come off of their electric Partially, yeah. yeah. There, there right. is a, currently a $2 meter charge in your right. electric mm -hmm. base cost. That $2 will be pulled out and taken away and then this week it will be, yeah. So it's an additional dollar. Additional dollar. Well, we can keep going through this, but I mean, yeah. potentially that's an option. You know, if you look at it from a use perspective, use, U-S-E, uh, you know, the uh, corporations in town pay much larger taxes than, let's say, a residential house. Uh, do they get the, ben you know, do they actually get the benefit of the streetlights to the value of the taxes they pay based on their value of their property? And probably not. Their employees do. So the streetlights really are a public safety thing for the residents. And so we thought this is actually a more fair process. Some of the industries have you know, what, eight, nine meters. You know, they're gonna pay eight, <coughs> eight, nine times that fee. But a resident is gonna just pay that, that one fee and they get the value of having streetlights in the entire community for $3.50. You know, we could put it on taxes, but then, you know, the industry picks up that cost and we've heard I think in the past that you know uh, industry feels a little overburdened with their taxes the way it is and this is one way of uh, maybe making that issue more palatable but that's up to you to decide if you want to help continue to do that or you could put it on taxes instead of putting it on This one, <laughs> do we want? Can I cover everything? So it's about a five and a, it's a five and a quarter percent increase in the levy, um, which actually right now there's an estimated three percent increase in the tax capacity. So a five percent, five and a quarter percent increase in the levy has about a one and a half percent impact on the tax rate. Now these items here that will start this list of things that are currently in the budget and included in the tax levy. Obviously, you would have the option to pull any of those out at one point, but I wanted to highlight what those changes were that are creating the levy increase. So the first one is the replacing a couple of exterior doors at the city hall. It costs about 15,000 or has about a 0.2% increase or impact on the tax increase. Then adding the assistant city manager uh, has about $110,000 impact and uh, would be, the assistant city manager will be 20% funded by the PUC, and then um, with that $50,000 change with the EDC contribution not being there anymore would contribute to, or has helped with part of that. The uh, Human Rights Commission has asked for a $3,200 increase, that's less than a half a percent impact. Adding the additional police investigator adds about $94,000 to the levy or 1.3%. Um, and then I probably need to do the next one first. There's a, uh, been a staffing request requested or staffing change request for the fire department. Um, it would be taking an employee, a full-time employee that's currently split between the fire and, uh, and the police department and moving them completely to the fire department. And so then the police anticipate possibly needing another part-time administrator. 
so between the two, it's uh, 19,000 for the part-time, and then it adds another $43,000 roughly to the fire department. And then on to some of the park and rec projects that are in there. Uh, currently we have a lighting in there for Harmon Park, and this is for the volleyball and ice rink area. That's about $50,000. $200,000 is currently budgeted for the Herman Heights retaining wall. And I'm sure Tom could explain what those plans would be more than I could. And then some changes at Mueller. There's a few changes at Mueller Park. So there's this right field bullpen, turf and mound, about $9,600. Um, left field walkway, about $21,000. And the left field bullpen and retaining wall, about $30,000. And then at North Park, there's a couple of projects. There's 64,000 budgeted for dugouts and backstops, and 7,500 for a North Park stormwater inlet. And then continuing the uh, figurine replacement of Shunwell is another $40,000, and that's been ongoing for the last few years. Um, and then a new, for the Parks Department, a new trailer, about $8,200, and another enclosed trailer, I believe they were going to use for programs, of about $25,000. A new floor scrubber at Vogel of $31,000, another floor scrubber at Civic Center of $6,000, $25,000 is budgeted for a master plan um, at the parks, and then another $20,000 is budgeted for tree replacement within the parks and trail system. Now this is where <coughs> the next items are where the, the additional quarter percent came from, and I'm not entirely sure Steve might have to explain what this is for, right? but with Vendor Park, um, there was 164,000 that came in. Um, right now we have budgeted to use 18,000 out of the general fund balance to cover a portion of that. And then $73,000 of Parkland Dedication Fund. So the actual levy impact is 73,000 or about 1%. So that covers the things that are in the budget. Now these are some additional things that were in the original department request budget, but I pulled out and then the decisions can be made at this point to do with those items. Starting with the retail and economic development contribution of 35,000. Um, sinking funds for the fire truck replacement. And this is something we'd like to contribute to every year so that the funds are there as, as um, replacements and trucks need to be done. Um, that's about $256,000. And then also the sinking fund for the city facilities is about 455,000. There was a project to replace a controller in the Glockenspiel for $50,000. Um, additional lighting at Harmon Park on Field 1 of $200,000. Uh, new splash pad for the, for the park system of $205,000. Replacing the, the rest of the flooring that's not being done this year in City Hall of about $126,000. And then uh, City Hall lighting project. I know there was one budget this year, but it, I think it's been changed and this would be whatever that project was changed into, I guess, <laughs> about 40000 So that is what I have. Anybody have any questions, Carolyn? I guess I'll make <coughs> one. I guess, I don't know. In the past, we've always, we'll pick on the fire department and the city facilities, we always put money aside. because of where we were with the tax levy increase. Okay. So the original department requested budget as it stood with all of those items in there was about 29% or over 29%. So we went back and we started pulling things out just to get down to a more acceptable levy increase. And um, it's up to council, you know, if there's things that are in there that they want to pull out or things that they think are more important that need to be added back in, or if they want that levy increase to be higher, that's kind of where we relation to the sinking funds, I wanted to update you on where things were so it would help with that decision. Um, as far as the fire truck replacement fund is concerned right now, there's a current balance just under a million and a half um, with another 245000 going in there for the 2017 budget. I'm um, looking at their future projects. Um, there's nothing budgeted in the 18, no use, no use budgeted. Um, engine 10 has to be replaced in 2020. That's about 600000 
some bunker gear needs to be replaced in 2022, 2023, somewhere in that area, about 150,000. And then engine 31 would be the next big one in about 2031, that's a million dollars. So that, those projects total just over 2 million. And right now we have 1.5 million in there. And then as far as the city, facili city facilities go, we currently, <coughs> after this year's contribution, will have about 2.2 million in there. Through 2020, the projects that I could tell that needed to be done, and these are my rough numbers from the spreadsheet that Reg has developed, in 2019, there's a fire station roof of about 300,000, library roof of about 300,000, and then in 2020, the fire station HVAC, which is about 40, um, and then the city hall ballast in 2021, the library structural repairs of about 100,000 in 2022, and the community center ballast of, at 110,000 in 2020. So those total about 950,000. And as I said, at the end of this year, we'll have about 2.2 million in there. So I don't know if those numbers help decide. Have we got any big ticket items coming up in the next 10 years that we're aware of? Or? Well, I mean, a couple of roofs and stuff. These were the only projects I was aware of on the schedule that we have within our eight sheet that tells us what we should be putting away. Um, so 2019 were those two roofs that, that total about 600000 Those That was the next year that anything, uh, from there, from my perspective on that sheet, looked like it needed to be. On the falls here, with the fire department, by not putting anything in, they're going to have a major impact on you. I mean, we can't continuously not put in. So I guess I would sooner see something go in now, I don't care how small it is, and keep it up rather than cut cold turkey. President Schmitz and City Council, um, she has a sheet that we went through and I think we have, what, a 5% increase built into that. Um, 2019, I think, is when, uh, not 20, but 19 is when we're scheduled for the next big purchase. We talked about ordering it in 19 and then it'll be here in 2020. Well, sure. it'll be 30 years, the truck will be 30 years yeah. old in 19, so um, we're talking about maybe starting spec work maybe by the end of this year or the beginning of next year, because you're looking at probably a year and a half project. Um, after that, I think the next big one is the, uh, uh, is, is it uh, the rescue or is it uh, uh, 31? Um, well, the truck 90 in 2027. 90. Yeah, that would be the rescue truck. Um, you know, I haven't, <laughs> haven't looked at what, what those are running. Um, I, you know, I, uh, these things really increase quite a bit. I think we, we looked at uh, what the next aerial truck was going to cost. We paid 862000 for this one, and I think we figured it's going to be close to $2 million. Close to 2 million. So, you know, anything, you know, that we can contribute to that fund, I think we want to keep it going. Um, million dollars or so. <coughs> yeah, you know, you know, whether it has to be that much, I'm not quite sure, but, I, you know, I, I would like to continue that to make sure that uh, uh, these vehicles are, are getting updated when they should. The, there are other items in in that uh, in that fund as well. The the big ticket items we uh, we purchase our turnout <coughs> gear all at one time. Um, NFPA has standards on how many hours that these things are supposed to uh, be used and uh, should get rid of. And uh, our calculation is just a little over eight years. So we try to replace ours every eight years. Um, as you know, we just replaced uh, all the uh, SCBAs. They're good for 15 years now. Uh, the last time I think they were only 10, so um, we've built that in as well. So there, there's there's quite a few, th or there's other things in there besides just the trucks. Mr. President, you know, the uh, uh, both Park and Rec and Fire Department and, and in essence all the departments uh, are contributing like to the facility funds to replace their roofs and things like that. But at the same time, <clears throat> if something catastrophic were to happen, uh, we would, and we didn't have enough money in that fund to deal with it, we would, you know, we would look at our backup system, which is the general fund reserve balance, which is sitting at $5.5 million and is 59%. You know, we need to be 35 to 50%, according to the state auditor. So when things come up, 
this isn't the only fund that you can use money out of. You can access the general fund as a backup. So, you know, if the, the money isn't in that fund, you have money. You yeah, can have any in the general fund. fund if we don't start <coughs> keeping up yeah. funding. So no, I'm, I'm not saying we don't. I'm just saying whenever, you know, there's a backup system for the fire department, there's a backup system for the park and rec, right. that if something catastrophic happens, if they don't have enough money in that fund, we do have the general fund, and we could probably spend down $2 million out of that, then we still would be okay with the state at 35% of fund balance. So, you know, and then we, we would work at building it back up you know, through time like we did. But if we do a little bit, I, I guess what yep. I'm leaning toward is we do it at least something don't take it all out then because someday it's going to bite us. Yeah. I mean, I'm okay Reserves with that. Are <laughs> so we were, you know, uh, council president gave myself a uh, kind of directive 5%. Let's, let's not bring in another 20. So now the hard part is yours. You yep. decide what you want to remove and what you want to add back in. Now you did what I said, now I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to please. But Charlie, I, I know last I, year we kind of walked through the each individual item, and could we maybe we can. go back to slide number three, um, which talks about items to be included in the budget and levy. This slide will come up again, correct? That's why I didn't have it on. Yep. Now it's on. Was the right one. So if we walk our way through this particular slide, we can't really do a lot. We have security issues. So the first one we've kind of decided on, we voted last council meeting to uh, do item number two. Um, I have a question on number yeah. two before we move on. Um, the cost that you have there, can you explain that again? The 110000 what that all includes? and what That is salary and benefits. That's salary and taxes. And you said it's part of this paid by the PUC or part They'll, of the 110 would be covered, would come back as revenue from the PUC. So 20% 20 of that would be covered by PUC. Okay. Now for economic development, the PUC was um, supporting the Economic Development Corporation for when they were contributing what? 50,000. Being this is going to be that new economic development position, would they not help fund that position? It would depend on what the system or what the job descriptions that we, I mean, that's kind of how we decided what portions of which jobs the PUC helps fund. We could, we could set it up that way, yes. It, this, the 80-20 was what was here six years ago, and so that's what was inserted in until we make a change. So that m number might change. Well, the number stays the same, it's just who's gonna pay what would change. Just the revenue. Yeah. The revenue would help decrease the levy that they would need. Yep. If there was additional re revenue coming from the PUC. So if they provide an additional 30,000, that'd be uh, a half a percent would drop on the tax levy. Yeah. This is the total number yep. on the expense side, yep. regardless okay. of what they pay. Yep. The increases on the revenue. Could, could we take the like the 15,000 on the exterior doors, can that come out of the facilities? I think it could, yeah. Oops. So we could use fund balance for that, well not fund, but that fund balance, <laughs> not the general fund balance. Right. But. So you're gonna keep track of these little notes as we mm -hmm. zip through these? We're on um, video. <laughs> <laughs> now the increase, because I know we last year we kind of had a some fuzzy math there. Um, increase to Human Rights Commission, though my understanding is because they want to do more promotional um, human rights events in the next year. They asked for 3,200. Is, is, that was know? their increase. An increase in that. Yeah, so they're asking for a total of 7,100, I believe. Uh, I guess I haven't seen the specifics for what they're asking for, but we could have a lot of departments ask for a lot of different things. It doesn't matter if we have to mean we're going to fund it. So I, it's something we certainly could, I mean, it's just such a small minor amount, but still it's an amount. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'd like to know more about the police investigator position and the part-time administrative assistant. I, I know our interest in activity increases in that area, but <coughs> I'd like to know more maybe from our chief on what what's the plan there and, and does it have to be a new position? Could it be somebody internally? Do we know if this is a long-term trend or if it's just a, a blip on, on police activity? Yeah, we had asked uh, uh, Chief Whelan to provide uh, the justification, and uh, so we included it in the budget, mm -hmm. and he's uh, currently working on that as I speak. Well, maybe not right this moment, but he's <laughs> working on it. Uh, so that'll come before the city council. It'll go to personnel first, because it's an addition to the current staffing level. Uh, so as soon as we get that justification, then we'll carry it forward, as well as the police part-time and the fire department staffing. You know, the justification will be brought to personnel first and then city council for. So I don't know if I'm a fan to have it included in our budget, because that means we've already approved it. So I would recommend you take that out for now. Well, I think we have to have it in because of the tax levy. We won't be able to put it back in like can't that. Put yeah. back in. Well, we we, we put can't put in. the money back in. We can't <laughs> decide what we do with the money. If we did decide to do something different. Right, right. You, could, you yeah. could rearrange things later and keep it in there, but something no. else would have to come out Correct. at that point. Right. Or you have to pull the reserve. Right. And the personnel hasn't made a recommendation to the council on this either yet. That's why I don't think it should be anything. Right. Not yet. I mean, yeah. maybe next year. It almost should be on that second list rather than in the budget list. Yeah. Well, the, not the included, the ones under consideration. Well, the ones that are included are also under consideration. But approving it today means we're basically approving it. And I'm, I'm not there yet. I, I'm not here about documentation. Yeah. No, what you're approving is the dollar. The dollar so that's if you decide to not money. do the police investigator, but you want to put more playground in for $94,000, now you can change that because you got the $94,000. If you remove it from the budget, the preliminary budget, and then when you finalize a budget in December, and you say, okay, we're not gonna do the police investigator, it's out, but we wanna do the playground, you don't have the $94,000. So really what we wanna do is set the levy. That's all we're doing. Yeah, we're just right. setting the, if we don't wanna go over and 5%, yep. we, you know, I that's agree. the budget. You know, but we can talk about it if we do want to Absolutely. go somehow. Right. We have the right to do it. Yeah. Right. But just we, we need to make sure we got the right dollar value for the levy. Yeah. This was, the, you know, the process that we've used in past years was we would come in high, you know, twenty percent high. Everybody get oh, excited, and then we say, well, what do you want to do on this issue? Happened. What do you want to do on this issue? And then we say, well, we don't want to do that, so we take it out, and we end up getting an eight percent increase instead of twenty. So this time we start with a five percent, and then say. What do you want to add in, or what do you want to take out? But the goal was to try and keep it at you know, five percent, which is you know acceptable. If you want to raise it to twelve percent by adding things in, that's your that's your discretion. You know, we just took it away from you and gave it to us. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and and you know so this this act that you would do today, this vote sets the maximum tax levy, but between now and December twenty. 29th, or whenever we got to get the, the levy in the second meeting in December, you can mold this amount of money into anything you want to, sure. to do. You just can't raise it. Now, you can raise the actual budget. You can spend more money, but you'd have to take it out of uh, general fund balance. But if we have some things at this point that none of us are really supportive of, it can be taken out. Correct. It should be taken out. It should be. Yeah. Now. I guess I kind of still have a question about the fire department staffing, you know, so we went from having a part-time fire chief to a full-time chief and a part-time uh, secretary, now to full-time. So, and my understanding when we hired the chief that he's taking some on the inspections as far as the rental and on that aspect. If now we need more staffing, could we be taking that from engineering or from the inspections office 
in regards to cover that? I don't know. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know, with yeah, basically what you have is a, a half-time uh, clerical at the police department and a half-time at the fire department. Right? The, the full-time uh, fire chief now is taking over much more uh, activity from the police pers from the fire department perspective, as far as in, uh, rental inspections and things of that nature. Uh, as you might imagine, that if the police chief is doing more, there's likely going to be more paperwork coming through that particular office. Now that paperwork used to be done at the uh, front counter at the engineering department, you know, when it was building code, when they were doing the inspections, okay, that activity shifted over. So they always had a half time. Now that they've had some time to analyze how much work uh, goes into all the inspections and keeping things up, the, the uh, fire chief is, is recommending that we go from a half time to a full time. That opens up that half time uh, police position that was still needed in the police department. So that's, those two things are tied at the hip. You know, you do one, you know, you gotta do the other basically. If you make the assumption that it's needed, you know, in the police department or the fire department. Uh, fire chief has stated, you know, it's needed. He's, he's submitted uh, the justification, which he believes uh, warrants, you know, a full-time position. Uh, police chief is working on his justification <coughs> for uh, both the police investigator and the part-time administrative uh, employee. I guess at some point we probably need to share that justification with the council so that they, you know, can make an informed decision. Yeah, well, I think if, it, if you leave it in here, you can always pull it out, right? Yeah. But if you take it out, it's unlikely you're going to be able to put it back in there. You know, if, if you do decide it's warranted. Well, if we set the levy at five percent in either any place that you put it, I mean, you can put it in and out one. It forces us to be very conservative, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think we all talked last time that we're not going to do this twenty-five percent increase and have the whole public go crazy and really cut it down and. They feel like it's a bait and switch, and there's all that whole complaint that I'll never support again. So I, I think we need to stick to a number, whatever that number might be. And so can we move to the next page then and just take a... Well, I, as long as we're just talking here. One thing, too, that I know Mary brought up at the last budget work session we have, that we should have more of these anyway. And I think it's something that when we're done tonight and we approve the levy that we should put in the next wait till December, but somewhere in between that, even before we meet with the administrative staff and stuff, that we sit down again as a city council and go through the, the budget, discuss some of these issues if we want. And another work session. Another right? work session, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they're always beneficial. We I always pick some up. So. I'd be comfortable with that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we could do that later on after the meeting or before the meeting's over, whatever, to set a date. Maybe a way of looking at this is we, you know, if we wanted to set the levy at that five and a quarter, I'd say, that's it. And then you can take out things you don't want and put things in you do want, or do you just arbitrarily pick and, you know, it, it, you got the items for council decisions, which was a retail economic development, sinking fund, fire truck, city facilities, shown now, all, all of those numbers, or do you say, we may do those personnel things and we want to do, we want to put money in for the fire truck and we want to put 100,000 in. That's going to jack it up one and a quarter percent. So do you pick like an 8% and just say, we don't know what we're going to pick from this list, but we know we want to put money in the fire, mm -hmm. the fire truck and we'll make that decision as we go through the work session. Right. And then when you finally get that all settled up, what you're going to fund, what you're not going to fund, you may be at 3%. You know, who knows? Or you may be at 6%. But <clears throat> I think I don't think the idea is to, to work it out now. You know, the idea is to kind of say, what would we want in there? And then work through the work session and say, is that legitimate or not? Because you can always go down right. in levy, but you can't go up. So you set the levy too low, something comes up, you say, I really do want to put money in for the fire truck. 
then it's going to have to just come out of your uh, general fund reserve if you're going to do that. So, I mean, it's up to you whatever you want to do, but we have to set a minimum or a maximum. We have to set a maximum levy tonight, whatever that number is. I do want to go to the side that you took off before. I want to make a comment on it. You got to the advance. Which one? Oh, the last slide. Yeah. Keep going. Alan? This one here, if I understood you correct, the sinking fund city facilities, the 455 is in the budget, or we have to it decide is not on it. In the right now. Okay, at present, I didn't get a chance to look at the history. What have we normally done each year? It's you know, very, it's been one of the things that it's been played with the most within the budgeting yeah. process. This year we have. It has been years. It was, it was the flexible. 375 going into this year. 375? It's, it's been lower. There's been years where there's been nothing. Yep. That's, that's the fund that we utilize that if we had funds, we stuck it in. If we didn't have funds, we didn't. Knowing full well that, that uh, you know, when you get 220 or $2.2 .2 million, not all the roofs are going to go at the same time. Right, correct. I mean, do you remember how long ago Red, the previous finance director we set that up? Is it like eight years? Oh, yeah, at least. Eight, nine years? At least. <laughs> Maybe more than that. I know the numbers given for the projections were really strong on all of our buildings when we did the worksheet. I know shortly before he left, they, had, they spent a lot of time going through that spreadsheet and making mm -hmm. sure all the facilities were on there. And this year we even went through and added the stuff for the Herman Monument. Okay. That's what I want to just double check on. I know there's really just been a brief discussion on the retail economic development, but I still don't understand why that got pulled. And then we didn't really vote on that or wasn't really much of a discussion on that other than um, more talk with our, our other development corporation. So. I guess well, there I was no vote. It, it no, just was, no you know, there was a discussion at that meeting and. And uh, when we were putting the budget together, we just said, how do you get down to 5%? It's as simple as that. And this is our, this would be, let's say, our priority list. And you may have a different priority list. And, and you plug stuff back in and, and take stuff out. So just because I've been trying to listen to this and figure it What's on the screen now is not in the 5% budget? Correct. Right. It is not there. It is not there. So if you add it, it would go up, and then you could take it out later. But if you stay with the 5%, none of this will get added in. Not without taking something else out. Or reserves, which we don't yeah. want to touch. But if, you, if you take the police investigator out, you get $90,000 that you get put towards something else. Well, I just wanted to make sure that I knew that this was not included in the 5% that you're talking about, or 5 and a half. Yep. Uh, Mr. Schmitz, when was the last master park plan done? It was 1989, except for the update in the comp plan of 2007. So um, the uh, $25,000 in that line item is for an update of the system master plan, but also a few unit plans that need updates, including Riverside Park um, and Herman Heights Park. Another big one in parks was the Herman Heights retaining wall. I, 
I just remember a few years back that we were talking that maybe that would be done with Center Street project. Mr. Kaler, is that we were trying to uh, work for? I, I uh, investigated the option of using some state aid funding for that, and I think the district state aid engineer and office of state aid are kind of lukewarm on that. It's not really part of the structural integrity of the street. I think you'd probably have to attempt to get some different grant monies if you wanted to try and find something else or to renew money is an option as well in my opinion. Wouldn't, wouldn't this uh, the, the retaining wall be something that we could get through the state grant program after we update the master plan for Herman Heights Park and apply for regional <coughs> designation, those would be two more steps we need to complete before we're um, able to apply for legacy grants. We need to be re regionally designated or designated as a regional park or a regional trail. And prior to that, you need to have a master plan, a unit master plan. So is that something that is this a two-year process we could wait? Retaining wall? Yeah. Well, in my opinion, it's a safety um, hazard and a um, maintenance uh, concern. And it looks like X. Yes, and my yeah. proposal <laughs> is to eliminate that and slope it like the 5th North Diocese Hill. I think something needs to be done with it. Mm. It's just yeah, it's getting worse. Now we do have three quarters of a million dollars earmarked in renew for Herman Heights to relocate Monument Street off the crest of the hill and put in parking infrastructure. Can we use that renew money for it? If it really was a part of it? I mean, a part of the Herman project. No. No, that's not like, no, Excuse me, Mr. President, I, I think the designation of the statute is pretty specific and it would not apply yeah. to this. When we sold it to the citizens, the Renew Project, it was a safety concern. It was, it was a safety, and, and we were making a bus turnaround and parking lot improvements to the park. We were discussing it. <coughs> but the wall wasn't The wall was not discussed. No. I, just, just to clarify that, I have a, a question for Steve Kaler and uh, Mr. Schmitz. Okay, now, you're talking about sloping, removing the retaining wall. There are no blocks. You're sloping it? Correct? Yes. And I think that was discussed in uh, Steve's office. But wasn't there a lot of complications with that? We have the restroom up there, a sanitary sewer line. I saw the topo drawings that somebody provided us. I don't want to run into a snag where, well, we got to move a restroom. We need 150000 more. we got to move a sanitary sewer line. We need 100000 more. I just want to make sure of that. Uh, Mr. President and Council members, um, you're correct, Councilor. There are some conflicts with regard to the existing restroom and the sp spruce trees up on top of the hill. There have been some preliminary design efforts put forth, but I think as part of the final design process that would have to be flushed, flushed out and may have to relocate the restroom, and that's correct. So 200000 is not covering this project? Um, I didn't do the estimate. Okay. I can't recall. I just want to make sure that not that... Come June, while well, we're $100,000 short, we got to move a restroom. There may be an option to do a hybrid where you do a small retaining wall to maintain that existing facility in the trees and you can slope some of the lower portions. Needs to be some geotechnical investigation. We don't know what's in that hillside or what's going to hold. So. so just because we got it in the budget, then it'll come back to us before anything is going to be done. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I had three of these larger ticket items in my department requested budget of the $200,000 range, including the Herman Heights retaining wall, uh, replacing the field lights on field one at Harmon Park, um, and towers, the entire infrastructure, the old wooden poles on field one along Garden Street. That was 200 grand. And then uh, $205,000 requested for our first splash pad uh, probably in the upper North Hilltop area where there are no waiting pools. Um, and so through discussions between the finance director and myself, we pulled out those, t those two items, the splash pad and um, the Harmon Park 
uh, field one lighting project, which totaled four hundred and five thousand dollars, and also fifty grand to replace the analog controller with a digital controller in the glockage wheel. So that was four hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars that was pulled off the park and rec table. Um, that's not in the <coughs> projected budget at this point. And you have that in information in the packet. Well, I know the county is looking at a four and a quarter percent. We're looking at five and a quarter. I don't know what the, where the school's at. much over five percent that's all out for our taxpayers when we start adding all that out so it just challenges us to roll up our sleeves and take a look at all the categories one more time just like we used to do back seven eight years ago when we were going through horrific budget times and um, i think there's some things on here that we need to put back in and, and some things that we probably need to take a look at cutting or delaying whether it's six months or whether it's Or identify a different uh, funding source. Or if I need a uh, yeah. Yep. <coughs> so I don't know if we're ready to throw a motion out there on this or not. So are we going to look at five, the five and about a quarter that we have set? Or and five and a half in my head is where I was going to, thought we'd balance out at, but I don't know where everybody else is at. Or do we give ourselves a little bit of leave room at eight to, I mean, granted, I don't think we would, any of us would approve anything over five. But yeah, we should stick to five. I think it forces us. To I say it forces us, we stick to the five this evening. So when they get that preliminary tax statement, City Hall isn't ringing off the hook. Mm -hmm. I'd be fine at five, five and a half. That's, that's the max. So. Now, five and a half. If I would take the 15000 for the city hall doors out of the city facilities fund, we are at 5.07 percent. Well, we still got discussions on a lot of these other items. Yeah. Here, so. <coughs> well, let's uh, see if we can move something forward. I'll, I'll offer a where are we at here on 6C. resolution for 2018 budget with a 5.5 percent maximum increase second we got a motion to second off resolution any more discussion that would be 5.5 finance director please go to roll councillor fisher yes councillor matt yes councillor schultz yes councillor christian yes Yes, motion carries. Item 6E, consider resolution to accept <coughs> donations offered to the city for the park and rec department for identified purposes. I'm sorry, as part of that resolution, it also sets the preliminary hearing for December 6th. Oh, I'll do that, yes. Or the final the public hearing. Donations to the City of New Alm for the Parks and Recs Department. Second. Second. We got a motion to second off resolution. We have reading. Any more discussion? Seeing none. Finance Director, please call the roll. Councilor Fisher? Yes. Councilor Mack? Yes. Councilor Schultz? Yes. Councilor Christian? Yes. 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 Motion carries. Item 6E consider motion approving the final assessment rules for the 2016 surface restructuring project. Set a date for public hearing for Tuesday, October 17, 2017, at 4.30 p.m. I'll offer that motion. Second. We got a motion to second. Anyone in this case? See none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item 6F. Consider resolution approving the request of Dwayne Wendler to vacate an easement area between 
suspend the rules for action on the addendum. Second. We got a motion and a second. <laughs> Any more discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries. Motion. Okay. Consider a motion to schedule a public hearing for noise variance request from Shane Zusdorf and Heidi Holm to have amplified outdoor music during the wedding reception to be held at 20, uh, 226 20th North Street Saturday, October 7th, 2017. I'll offer the motion. Second. We got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Do we have a lot of, and I know this will come up at our, our public hearing, but are there a lot of residents in that? I know this is no. an industrial no. park area, but. This is garages cool. and. I just want to make sure if there is, they should have a secondary plan just in case. I think diagonally across the street, you've got an apartment complex, oh. but it's basically industrial everywhere else. The notices will go out to those folks. Will Everybody reach, within the that, that apartment building, yeah. probably. Well, well, they should have a backup plan. I think there's three case. three residents. I think Dave was signaling. Okay. So. All right. Okay. This time we'll go to item. Oh, we got a vote on that. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. All in favor say aye. 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 Close no. Motion carries. Item 2A. Conduct a public hearing to first reading ordinance number 17-018 and ordinance number 17-019, fifth series, amending chapter 20, part five of the city code, city of New Ulm, relative to cable television franchise. And just for all the public out there that's watching this, this is gonna be a 54 minute reading. And if you have other programs you'd like to In other to words, watch, run, run. Yeah. <laughs> Please sign off and go for it. All right, Roger. Um, I'm sorry, what? What? Your, your screen is on what's showing on your, your screen, screen is live is on TV. Well, we don't have a live screen. Let's go ahead. All right. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, uh, there are two ordinances for the council to be considering. Um, these result from probably two plus years of negotiations with uh, New Home Telecom and uh, Comcast who have the existing cable TV franchises. Uh, they have to be individual ordinances. What I've done <coughs> is to, we're also required to read the ordinances one time at the first reading. So instead of reading both ordinances, each of which is about 23 pages long, I pre-recorded reading the identical content in each where the ordinances differ, I made note of that during the course of what I've recorded. Uh, I know there are representatives from Comcast and New Home Telecom who are president, present, who've been waiting throughout this meeting. I don't know before the reading begins if any of the members of the council have got any questions 
about the ordinances that they may have to be addressed by the representatives of the company. If you don't, I'm sure they probably may not stick around for 54 minutes to hear these. Um, but we can tell you it was passed by the Newell Cable Commission without yes. any objections. Yep. So, unless anyone has any questions, I would. This is a first reading of two new proposed city ordinances. Ordinance number 17018, fifth series, and ordinance number 17019, fifth series. The ordinances are essentially identical. I will be reading ordinance number 17018, and where appropriate, we'll read the language that is unique to ordinance number 17019. Except in those situations, the language in each ordinance is the same. Ordinance number 17018, fifth series, City of Duval, Brown County, Minnesota, an ordinance for amending chapter 20, part 5 of the city code of the City of Duval relative to a cable television franchise. Whereas by Ordinance 83-026, Second Series, originally approved January 23, 1984, and as subsequently modified by, by Ordinances 88-046, Second Series, 99-036, Third Series, and 00-052, third series, the city granted to Time Warner Cable and its successors a cable television franchise. Ordinance number 17019 provides, whereas by ordinance 00-051, third series, originally approved August 22, 2000, the city granted to Newell Telecom and its successors a cable television franchise. And whereas under its terms, said franchise has expired, and whereas the city of Duval having determined that the financial, legal, and technical ability of the franchisee is reasonably sufficient to provide the services, facilities, and equipment necessary to meet the future cable-related needs of the community, desires to enact this ordinance granting a franchise to the franchisee for the construction, operation, and maintenance of a cable system on the terms and conditions set forth herein. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Duval. Subdivision 1, definition of terms. For the purpose of this franchise agreement, capitalized terms, phrases, words, and abbreviations shall have the meanings ascribed to them in the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984, as amended from time to time, 47 U.S.C. sections 521 at SEC, the Cable Act. So paragraph A. Access channels means any channel or portion of a channel utilized for public, educational, or governmental programming. Small i, public access means access where community-based, non-commercial organizations, groups, or individual members of the general public on a non-discriminatory basis are the primary users. Small i, I. Educational access means access where schools are the primary users, having editorial control over programming and services. For purposes of this definition, school means any state-accredited educational institution, public or private, including, for example, primary and secondary schools, colleges, and universities. Small i, I, I. Government access means access where governmental institutions or their designees or the primary users having editorial control over programming and services. So paragraph P, basic cable service means any service tier which includes the lawful retransmission of local television broadcast signals. Basic cable service as defined herein shall not be inconsistent with 47 U.S.C. section 5223. Subdivision C, cable service shall mean A, the one-way transmission to subscribers of I, video programming or II, other programming service, and B, subscriber interaction, if any, which is required for the selection or use of such video programming or other programming service. For the purposes of this definition, video programming is programming provided by or generally considered comparable to programming provided by a television broadcast station. And other programming service is information that a cable operator makes available to all subscribers generally. Subdivision D. 
Cable system shall have meaning specified for cable system in the Act. Unless otherwise, otherwise spe specified, it shall in this document refer to the cable system constructed and operated in the city under this franchise. City and grantor is the city of New Orleans, Minnesota. F, drop, shall mean the cable that connects the subscriber terminal to the nearest feeder cable of the cable system. G, effective date means the date on which this ordinance becomes effective, pursuant to the provisions of the city charter and the code of the city of New Orleans, Minnesota. H, franchise area means the present legal boundaries of the city as, as of the effective date and shall also include any ad additions thereto by annexation or other legal means. French I, franchisee and grantee, is Comcast of Arkansas slash Florida slash Louisiana slash Minnesota slash Mississippi slash Tennessee LLC, a Minnesota limited liability company. For the purposes of Ordinance 17 019, Subdivision I, franchisee and grantee, is New Orleans Telecom Inc., a Minnesota corporation. Subdivision J, gross revenues shall mean all revenue derived directly or indirectly by the grantee from the operation of the cable system to provide cable services within the franchise area. Gross revenues shall include, by way of example and not limitation, revenues from basic service, other cable service tiers, monthly fees for programming offered on a per channel or per program basis, installation and reconnection, Least channel fees, converter rentals, advertising revenues subject only to the limitation in the following sentence, and other cable services offered over the system in the franchise area. Gross revenues shall not include commissions paid to third-party advertising agencies that are not owned or controlled by grantee. Gross revenues also does not include PEG fees, FCC regulatory fees, or any taxes or services furnished by the grantee herein imposed directly upon any subscriber or user by the state grantor or other governmental unit and collected by the grantee on behalf of said governmental unit, such as a sales tax. The franchise fee is not such a tax. The grantor acknowledges and agrees that the grantee shall maintain its books and records in a manner consistent with generally ex accepted accounting principles, GAAP, or successor accounting principles with which the grantee may be required to comply under the state or federal law. To the extent revenues are received by the grantee for the provision of a discounted bundle of services, which includes cable services and non-cable services, the grantee shall calculate revenues to be included in gross revenues in accordance with GAP. Subdivision K. Person means any natural person in all domestic and foreign corporations, closely held corporations, associations, syndicates, joint stock corporations, partnerships of every kind, clubs, businesses, common law trusts, societies, and slash or any other legal entity. L. Public ways shall mean the surface of and the space above and below any public street, road, highway, freeway, lane, path, public way, alley, court, sidewalk, boulevard, parkway, drive, or any easement or right of way now or here after held by the city, which shall entitle grantee to the use thereof for the purpose of installing or transmitting over poles, wires, cables, conductors, ducts, conduits, vaults, manholes, amplifiers, appliances, attachments, and other properties may be ordinarily necessary and pertinent to a cable system. M. Subscriber or subscribers means any person who or which lawfully subscribes to a cable service provided by grantee by means of or in connection with the cable system. Subdivision 2, Grant of Authority. A. Grant. The grantor hereby grants to the grantee a non-exclusive franchise authorizing the grantee to construct and operate a cable system in the public ways within the franchise area and for that purpose to erect, install, construct, repair, replace, reconstruct, maintain, or retain in any public ways such poles, wires, cables, conductors, ducts, conduits, vaults, manholes, pedestals, amplifiers, appliances, attachments, and other related property or equipment as may be necessary or pertinent to the cable system and to provide such services over the cable system system as may be lawfully allowed. B, term of franchise. The term of the franchise granted herein shall be 10 years, commencing upon the effective date of the, fr the franchise unless the franchise is renewed or is lawfully terminated in accordance with the terms of this franchise and the Cable Act. C, renewal. Any renewal of this franchise shall be governed by and comply with the provisions of Section 626 of the Cable Act as amended. D, reservation of authority. 
Nothing in this franchise shall I abrogate the right of the city to perform any public works or public improvements of any description. I, I be construed as a waiver of any codes or ordinances of general applicability promulgated by the city or I, I, I be construed as a waiver or release of the rights of the city and into the public ways. Subdivision 3, construction and maintenance of the cable system. A, construction, subject to grantor's non-discriminatory supervision and control and generally applicable law, grantee may erect, install, construct, repair, replace, reconstruct, and retain in, on, over, under, upon, across, and along the rights of way of grantor, such wires, cables, conductors, ducts, conduits, vaults, manholes, amplifiers, pedestals, attachments, and other property and equipment as are necessary and pertinent to the operation of a cable system within the city of the law of Minnesota. B, technical standards. Cable service shall be provided at a minimum in compliance with the technical standards promulgated by the Federal Communications Commission relating to cable communication systems contained in subpart K of part 76 of the Federal Communications Commissioner's rules and regulations relating to cable communication systems and found in Code of Federal Regulations, Title 47, Section 76.601 to 76.617. The results of tests required by the Federal Communications Commission must be filed within 10 days of the conduct of the test with the grantor. C. New grades and lines. If the grades or lines of any public right away within the franchise area are lawfully changed at any time during the term of the franchise, then the grantee shall, upon reasonable advance, written notice from, grant, from the grantor, which shall not be less than 10, 10 business days, and at its own cost and expense, protect or promptly alter or relocate the cable system or any part thereof so as to conform with any such new grades or lines. If public sub funds are available to any other user of the public right away for the purpose of defraying the cost of any of the foregoing, the grantor shall notify the grantee of such funding and make available such funds to the grantee. D. Relocation at request of third party. The grantee shall, upon reasonable prior written request of any person holding a permit issued by the city to move any structure, temporarily move its wires to permit the moving of such structure, provided I, the grantee may impose a reasonable charge on any person for the movement of its wires, and such charge may be required to be paid in advance of the movement of its wires. And I, I, the grantee is given not less than 10 business days advance written notice to arrange for such temporary relocation. E, undergrounding and beautification projects in the event all users of the public right of way relocate aerial facilities underground as part of an undergrounding or neighborhood beautification project. The grantee shall participate in the planning for relocation of its aerial facilities contemporaneously with other utilities. Grantee's relocation costs shall be included in any computation of necessary project funding by the municipality or private parties. Grantee shall be entitled to reimbursement of its relocation costs from public or private funds raised for the project and made available to other users of the public way. If such funding is not available, grantee shall be responsible for the cost of relocating its facilities. F line extension small i. Grantee shall construct and operate its cable system so as to provide cable service within the franchise area where there exists a density equivalent of seven dwelling units per one quarter mile of heater cable as measured from the nearest active plant of the cable system if the extension is to be constructed using aerial plant and nine dwelling units per one quarter mile of feeder cable as measured from the nearest active plant if the extension is to be constructed using underground plant. The city for their part shall require developers and utility companies to provide the grantee with at least 15 days advance notice of an available open trench for the placement of necessary cable. I, I, where the density is less than that specified above, grantee shall inform persons requesting service of the possibility of paying for installation of a line extension and shall offer to provide them with a free written estimate of the cost which shall be provided within 30 working days of such a request. Grantee may offer the persons requesting service the opportunity to prepay some or all of the necessary line extensions according to its regular business policies. Grantees shall at all times implement such line extension policy in a non-discriminatory manner throughout the city. III, any residential unit located within 125 feet from the nearest point of access on the street from which the cable system is designed to serve the site shall be connected to the cable system at no charge other than the standard installation charge. Grantees shall, upon request of any potential subscriber residing in the city beyond the 125-foot limit, extend service to such subscriber provided that the subscriber shall pay the net additional drop costs unless the grantee agrees to waive such costs. To the extent required by applicable laws, grantees
grantee agrees that it shall impose installation costs for non-standard installations in a uniform and non-discriminatory manner throughout the city. G, police powers. Grantees' rights here under are subject to the police powers of grantor to adopt and enforce ordinances necessary to the safety, health, and welfare of the public, and grantee agrees to comply with all generally applicable and competitively neutral provisions of the city code. Grantor shall have the right to adopt from time to time such ordinances may be deemed necessary in the exercise of its police power, provided that such here and after enacted ordinances shall be reasonable and not materially modify the terms of this franchise. Any conflict between the provisions of this franchise and any other present or future lawful exercise of the city's police power shall be resolved in favor of the franchisee. Grantee reserves all rights it may have to challenge any modifications to the city code, whether arising in contract or at law. The city reserves all of its rights and defenses to such challenges, whether arising in contract or at law. H. Special testing. The parties shall share the cost of any required special testing as a result of the application, requirement, or enforcement of any public law or regulation. The city shall endeavor to so arrange its request for such special testing so as to minimize hardship or inconvenience to grantee or to the subscribers caused by such testing. Before ordering such tests, grantees shall be afforded 30 days to correct problems or complaints which tests were ordered. The city shall meet with the grantee prior to requiring special tests to discuss the need for such and, if possible, visually inspect those locations which are the focus of concern. If, after such meetings and inspections, the city wishes to commence special tests and the 30 days have elapsed without correction of the matter in controversy or unresolved complaints, the test shall be conducted by a qualified engineer mutually selected by city and grantee based upon a mutually agreed upon scope of work. Except as is expressly provided for herein, nothing in this franchise shall be considered as a waiver of any rights of the grantor or the grantee. I subscriber privacy. No signals of a class for cable communications channel may be transmitted from a subscriber terminal for purposes of monitoring individual viewing patterns or practices without the express written permission of the subscriber. The request for permission must be contained in a separate document with a prominent statement that the subscriber is authorizing the permission and full knowledge of its provisions. The written permission must be for a limited period of time, not to exceed one year, which is renewable at the option of the subscriber. The penalty may be invoked for a subscriber's failure to provide or renew the authorization. The authorization must be revocable at any time by the subscriber without penalty of any kind, small i. No information or data obtained by monitoring transmission of a signal from a subscriber terminal, and including but not limited to lists of the names and addresses of the subscribers or lists that identify the viewing habits of subscribers may be sold or otherwise made available to any person other than to the grantee and its employees for internal business use or to the subscriber who is the subject of that information unless the grantee has received specific written authorization from the subscriber to make the data available. II. Written permission from the subscriber must not be required for the systems conducting system-wide or individually addressed electronic sweeps for the purpose of verifying system integrity or monitoring for the purpose of billing. Confidentiality of this information is subject to paragraph 3.10a. III, for purposes of these provisions, a class 4 cable communications channel means a signaling path provided by a cable communication system to transmit signals of any type from a subscriber terminal to another point in the communication system. Subdivision 4, customer bills, privacy protection, and subscriber complaint procedures. A, response to customers in cooperation with grantor. Grantee shall promptly respond to all requests for service, repair, installation, and information from subscribers. Grantee acknowledges the grantor's interest in the prompt resolution of all cable complaints and shall work in close cooperation with the grantor to resolve complaints. B. Customer service standards. The grantee shall comply with the FCC standards and requirements for customer service set forth on Exhibit B, and as the same may be amended in the future throughout the terms of this franchise. C. Privacy protection. The grantee shall comply with all applicable federal and state privacy laws, including Section 631 of the Cable Act and regulations adopted pursuant thereto. D. Local office. Grantee shall maintain a convenient local customer service and bill payment location for matters such as and such as receiving subscriber payments, handling billing questions, equipment replacement, and customer service information. If grantee does not maintain an office within or within the reasonable vicinity of the city of New Orleans, equipment malfunctioning and requiring timely replacement 
will be exchanged, replaced by truck rule or an alternative arrangement in grantee's discretion. In the alternative, grantee shall maintain a drop box within the city in the world for receiving subscriber payments. The drop box shall be emptied regularly, and grantee shall take steps to ensure that subscribers are not inadvertently or mistakenly charged late fees or otherwise penalized for making use of the drop box. Grantee shall also make equipment changes and exchanges available via mail order or similar service made available to all subscribers. Grantee shall comply with the standards and requirements for customer service set forth below during the term of this franchise. Subdivision 5, Oversight and Regulation by Franchising Authority A, Franchise Fees. The grantee shall pay to the city a franchise fee in an amount equal to 5% of annual gross revenues received from the operation of the cable system to provide cable service to the franchise area that has entered into a cable franchise agreement with Grantor. Grantee shall not be compelled to pay any higher percentage of franchise fees than any other cable video service provider providing service in the franchise area with which Grantor has a franchise agreement. The payment of franchise fees shall be made on a regular made on a quarterly basis and shall be due 45 days after the close of each calendar quarter. Each franchise fee payment shall be accompanied by an accurate report prepared by a representative of the grantee showing the basis for the computation of the franchise fees paid during that period. Upon request, grantee shall supply such other information as is necessary to allow grantor to verify the accuracy of the fees. B. Audit. Grantee authorizes grantor the right to audit grantee's accounting and financial records upon reasonable notice for the purpose of determining grantee's compliance with Section 5.1 UN, and grantees shall file with grantor at least annually reports of gross revenues. C. Subscriber charges and contracts. Statements identifying current subscriber charges and the length and terms of residential subscriber contracts, if any, shall be provided by grantee and shall be available for public inspection of identification located within the City of DeWalt, Minnesota. Subdivision 6, transfer of cable system or franchise or control of grantee. A, transfer of ownership or control. Small i, no sale, transfer assignment or fundamental corporate change as defined in MinStat section 238.083 of this franchise shall take place without the written approval of the grantor, which approval may not be unreasonably withheld. A written request to the grantor for its approval must be made by the parties to the sale or transfer. Said approval shall not be required when grantee grants a security interest to its franchise and assets to secure indebtedness. II. Any sale or transfer of stock in grantee so as to create a new controlling interest in the system shall be subject to the requirements of this section 6.1. The term controlling interest is used here and is not limited to the majority stock ownership, but includes actual working control in whatever manner exercised. III. The parties to the sale or transfer shall make a written request to grantor for its approval of a sale or transfer and furnish all information required by law and grantor. IV. The grantor shall act by ordinance on the request within 120 days of the request provided it is receive all the information required by this franchise and or by applicable law. The grantor and grantee may by mutual agreement at any time extend the 120 day period. Subject to the foregoing, if the grantor fails to render a final decision on the request within 120 days, such request shall be deemed granted unless the requesting party and grantor agree to an extension of time. V. In reviewing a request for sale or transfer, the city may inquire into the legal, technical, and financial qualifications of the prospective controlling party or transferee, and grantee shall assist the city in so inquiring. The city may condition said sale or transfer upon such terms and conditions as it deems reasonably appropriate in accordance with applicable law. The I. Notwithstanding anything to the contrary in this, in this subsection, the prior approval of the city shall not be required for any sale, assignment, or transfer of the franchise or cable system to an entity controlling, control buyer under the same common control as grantee, provided that the proposed assignee or transfer must show financial responsibility as may be determined necessary by the city and must agree in writing to comply with all of the provisions of the franchise. Further, grantee may pledge the assets of the cable system for the purpose of, refin of financing without the consent of the city, provided that such pledge of assets shall not impair or mitigate grantees' responsibilities and capabilities to meet all of its obligations under the provisions of this franchise. B. Option to grantor. If the franchise or grantee's cable system is to be transferred or sold, grantor shall have a right of first refusal to purchase the cable system. Subdivision 7, PEG access programming. Number of PEG access channels. Grantee will continue to provide three PEG access channels in standard definition, SD format, from the term of the franchise. B, access channel locations. I, 
Access channels shall be carried on the basic cable service tier to the extent required by applicable law. Nothing herein precludes the grantee from charging for equipment needed for basic cable service, II. Grantee shall make reasonable efforts to minimize channel movements of access channels, III. Grantee shall provide the city with a minimum of 60 days notice and use best efforts to provide 120 days notice prior to the time access channel designations are changed. In the event of such changes in designation, grantee shall at grantee's expense include the notice of the changes on one month of any regular paper billing submitted to grantee subscribers to be mailed prior to the implementation of the change in this designation. IV, grantee agrees not to encrypt the access channels differently than any other commercial channels available on the cable system. C, access video standards, small i, standard definition, X, SD, digital access channels. A, grantee shall provide three activated downstream channels for PEG access use in a standard definition SD digital format in grantee's basic service SD access channel. Grantee, sh grantee shall carry all lawfully required components of the SD access channel signals provided by a designated access provider. A designated access provider shall be responsible for providing the SD access channel signal in an SD format to the demarcation point at the designated point of origin for the SD access channel. Grantee shall transport and distribute the SD access channel signal on its cable system and shall not unreasonably discriminate against SD access channels with respect to accessibility, functionality, and the application of any applicable Federal Communications Commission rules and regulations, including without limitation subpart K channel signal standards. B. With respect to signal quality, grantee shall not be required to carry an SD access channel in a higher quality format than that of the SD access channel signal delivered to grantee, but grantee shall distribute the SD access channel signal without de degradation. Upon reasonable written notice by a designated access provider, grantee shall verify signal delivery to subscribers with the designated access provider consistent with the requirements of this section 7.3. C. Grantee shall be responsible for costs associated with the transmission of SD access signals on its side of the demarcation point, which shall mean up to and including the modulator where the city signal is converted into a format to be transmitted to grantee. Designated access provider shall be responsible for costs associated with SD access signal transmission on its side of the demarcation point. I.I. On or after January 1, 2018, the city may provide a written request to grantee that one SD PEG channel be converted to a high definition channel. Grantee shall have 120 days from the date of receipt of the city's request to implement the HD PEG access channel. I.I.I. The HDPEG access channel provided in this section will not replace the PEG access channel described in Section 7.1 of this franchise. The city may continue to simulcast PEG programming on its SDPEG channel. The city shall only be responsible for the production costs associated with the provisions of an HD channel. Any and all costs associated with any modification in the PEG access channels or signals after the PEG access channels slash signals leave the city's currently designated playback facility shall be provided free of charge by grantee. However, the grantee shall have the right to offset from the PEG fee its reasonable actual cost for capital equipment, which grantee is required to purchase to facilitate the distribution of the PEG access channels upstream to grantee's head end. D, ownership of access channels. Grantee does not relinquish its ownership of or ultimate right of control over a channel by designated it for PEG use. A PEG access user, whether an individual, educational, or governmental user, acquires no property or other interest by virtue of the use of a channel position so designated. Grantee shall not exercise editorial control over any public, educational, or governmental use of a channel position, except grantee may refuse to transmit any public access program or portion of a public access program that contains obscenity, indecency, or nudity in violation of applicable law. Nothing herein shall be construed to obligate grantee to monitor the content of the PEG access channels, and grantee specifically disclaims any obligation to do so. E. Non-commercial use of PEG. Permitted non-commercial uses of the access channels shall include, by way of example and not limitation, one, the identification of financial supporters to s supporters similar to what is provided on public broadcasting stations, or two, the solicitation of financial support for the provision of PEG programming by the grantor or third-party users for charitable, educational, or governmental purposes, or three, programming offered without charge by accredited nonprofit educational institutions, which may, for example, offer telecourses over an 
access channel. F access channel carriage, small i. The grantor may request and grantee shall provide an additional access channel when the cumulative time on all of the existing access channels combined meets the following standard. Whenever one of the access channels in use during 80% of the weekdays, Monday through Friday, for 80% of the time during a consecutive three-hour period for six weeks running, and there is a demand for use of an additional channel for the same purpose, the grantee has six months in which to provide a new access channel for the same purpose, provided that the provision of the additional channel or channels does not require the cable system to install converters. II, the grantor or its designee shall be responsible for developing, implementing, interpreting, and enforcing rules for PEG access channel use. III, the grantee shall monitor the access channels for technical quality to ensure that they meet FCC technical standards, including those applicable to the carriage of access channels, provided, however, that the grantee is not responsible for the production quality of PEG programming productions. The grantor or its designee shall be responsible for the production and quality of all PEG access programming. G, free cable service to public buildings. Throughout the term of this franchise, grantees shall provide free of charge one service drop up to three digital television adapters if necessary and requested, and basic cable service, complimentary service to all of the sites listed on Exhibit A attached here too. H. Support grant for access costs. Commencing on the effective date of this franchise, grantees shall collect a per subscriber per month fee, PEG fee, of 33 cents solely in support of PEG capital means for the first five years of this franchise. Commencing on the fifth anniversary of the franchise, this Per subscriber payment shall increase to 45 cents per month upon the written request of the city. Grantee will remit to the PEG to the PG fee to the city on a quarterly basis, and the PEG fee shall be due 45 days after the close of each calendar year. This amount shall be in addition to any other required fee or payment, and upon the execution of this agreement by grantee, grantee shall further tender the sum of $20,000 cash as an advance on the PEG fee. PEG advance payment. Grantee may recruit the PEG advance payment in accordance with applicable law. Upon written request, the city will provide documentation to grantee of the expenditures made with the PEG fee. I, return lines access origination, small i. All franchise providers of cable service shall maintain the existing fiber paths in place as of the effective date to facilitate PEG origination slash return capacity in the city and shall construct new return line origination points in accordance with section 7.9b herein. Grantee shall not be responsible for fiber replacement, but will be responsible for normal maintenance of the existing fiber. Grantee anticipates but cannot guarantee that this will result in minimal fiber expenditures by the city over the franchise term. I.I. Grantee shall construct two new return line origination points in addition to those now existing to the following locations, 1212 North Franklin Street, Dual Pacific Center, uh, B, 122 South Garden Street, Global Field House. The existing origination points grantee now has in place are at the following locations, C, 100 North Broadway, City Hall Council Chamber, D, 17 North Broadway, Public Library, New Cat, E, 514 North Washington Street, Dual Area Catholic Schools, 6 North Intersection Exterior Location. Then as to Ordinance 17-019 for New Home Telecom, 414 South Payne Street, feed to replace ISD 88 at State Street DAC, B, 1600 Oak Street, New Public High School, C, 500 North German Street, Johnson Park. III, the existing origination points grantee now has in place are at the following locations, A, 100 North Broadway, City Hall Council Chamber, B, 17 North Broadway, Public Library, Dash New Camp, C, 514 North Washington Street, New American Catholic Schools, 6 North Intersection, Exterior location, D15 North State Street, previous ISD 88, now State Street Theater. Subdivision 8, Enforcement and Termination of Franchise A, Procedure for Remedying Franchise Violations, small i. If the grantor reasonably believes that grantee has failed to perform any obligation under this franchise or has failed to perform in a timely manner, the grantor shall notify grantee in writing, stating with reasonable specificity the nature of the alleged default. Grantee shall have 45 days from the receipt of 
such notice to a respond to the grantor contesting the grantor's assertion that a default has occurred and requesting a meeting in accordance with subsection B below. B, cure the default, or C, notify the grantor that grantee cannot cure the default within the 45 days because of the nature of the default. In the event the default cannot be cured within 45 days, grantee shall promptly take all reasonable steps to cure the default and notify grantor in writing and in detail as to the exact steps that will be taken and the projected completion date. In such case, the grantor may set a meeting in accordance with subsection II below to determine whether additional time beyond the 45 days specified above is indeed needed and whether grantee's proposed completion schedule and steps are reasonable. II. If grantee does not cure the alleged defect within the cure period stated above or by the projected completion date under subsection IC or denies the default and requests a meeting in accordance with IA or if the grantor orders a meeting in accordance with subsection IC, the grantor shall set a meeting to investigate the issues or the existence of the alleged default. The grantor shall notify grantee of the meeting in writing, and such meetings shall take place no less than 15 days after grantee's receipt of notice of the meeting. At the meeting, grantee shall be provided an opportunity to be heard and to present evidence in its defense small i, i, i. If after the meeting the grantor determines that a default exists, the grantor shall order grantee to correct or remedy the default or breach within 15 days or within such other reasonable time frame as the grantor shall determine. In the event the grantee does not cure within such time to the grantor's reasonable satisfaction, the grantor may a. withdraw an amount from the letter of credit as monetary damages, b. recommend the revocation of this franchise pursuant to the procedures in subsection 8.3 or c. recommend any other legal or equitable remedy available under this franchise or any applicable law. Small IV, grantee may appeal any decisions by grantor to an appropriate state or federal court or agency. B, letter of credit, small i, if there is a claim by the grantor of an uncured breach by grantee of a material provision of this franchise, then the grantor may require and grantee shall establish and provide within 30 days from receiving notice from the grantor to the grantor is security for the faithful performance by grantee of all of the provisions of this franchise, a letter of credit from a financial institution satisfactory to the grantor in the amount of $25,000. Small ii, in the event that grantee establishes a letter of credit pursuant to the procedures of this section, then the letter of credit shall be maintained at $20,000 until the allegations of the uncured breach have been resolved, small iii, after completion of the procedures set forth in Section 8A or other applicable provisions of this franchise, the letter of credit may be drawn upon by the grantor for purposes including but not limited to the following. A. Failure of the grantee to pay the grantor sums due under the terms of this franchise. B. Reimbursement of out-of-pocket costs borne by the grantor to correct franchise violations not corrected by grantee. A and C, monetary remedies or damages assessed against grantee due to default or breach of franchise requirements. Small IV, the grantor shall give grantee written notice of any withdrawal under this subsection. Upon such withdrawal, within seven days following receipt of such notice, grantee shall restore the letter of credit to the amount required under this franchise. Small V, grantee shall have the right to appeal to the city council for reimbursement in the event grantee believes that the letter of credit was drawn upon improperly. Grantee shall also have the right to judicial appeal if grantee believes the letter of credit has not been properly drawn upon in accordance with this franchise. Any funds the grantor erroneously or wrongfully withdraws from the letter of credit shall be returned to grantee with interest from the date of withdrawal at a rate equal to the prime rate of interest as quoted in the Wall Street Journal. C, termination procedure. If after grantor complies with the procedures in Section 8.1 herein, the alleged breach is substantial and remains uncured, grantor may elect to terminate the franchise. The grantor may place the issue of revocation and termination of this franchise before the governing body of grantor at a regular meeting. If grantor decides there is cause or reason to terminate, the following procedure shall be followed. Small i. Grantor shall provide grantee with a minimum of 30 days prior written notice of the reason or cause for proposed termination. Small i. I. Grantee shall be provided with an opportunity to be heard at a public hearing prior to any decision to terminate this franchise. After such hearing, if grantor decides to terminate this franchise, it shall provide grantee with written notice of its decision, together with written findings of fact supplementing such decision and stating the effective date of the franchise termination. Subdivision 9, Competitive Equity, a new video service provider, small i, Notwithstanding any other provision of this agreement or any other provision of law, if any, any video service provider, VSP, 
enters into any agreement with the grantor or receives a cable television franchise from the city to provide video services to subscribers in the franchise area that the grantee believes to be on terms more favorable than the material obligations under this franchise, then the provisions of this paragraph will apply. Material obligations include but are not limited to a 5% franchise fee, PEG funding, PEG channels, courtesy services, and customer service obligations, here and after material obligations. The grantee and the grantor shall enter into an agreement or other appropriate authorization, if necessary, containing the same material obligations and conditions as are applicable to the VSP within 60 days after the grantee submits a written request to the grantor. Small II. If there is no written franchise or agreement or other authorization between the new VSP and the grantor, the grantee and the grantor shall use the 60-day period to develop and enter into an agreement or other appropriate authorization if necessary, that to the maximum extent possible contains provisions that will ensure competitive equity between the grantee and other VSPs, taking into account the terms and conditions under which other VSPs are allowed to provide video services to subscribers. Small III. The term video service provider or VSP shall mean any entity using the public rights of way to provide multiple video programming services to subscribers for purchase or at no cost, regardless of the transmission method, facilities, or technology used. A VSP shall include, but is not limited to, any entity that provides cable services or multi channel, multi point distribution services. Subdivision 10, renewal abandonment. A, franchise renewal. Any renewal of this franchise shall be in accordance with applicable laws. B, abandonment. Small i, notwithstanding any provision in this franchise, grantee may not abandon the cable communication system or a portion of it that is the subject of this fran franchise without having given three months prior written notice to grantor. Grantee may not abandon the cable communication system or a portion of it without compensating grantor for damages resulting to grantor from the abandonment. Small i, i upon termination or forfeiture of this franchise. Unless otherwise required by applicable law, grantee shall remove its cable, wires, and appliances from the streets, alleys, and other public places within the franchise area, subject to the generally applicable provisions of the city code. Provided, however, that if grantee is providing services other than cable services or pursuant to Minnesota statutes, section 237.01 at SEC, the city shall not require the removal of the system. III. If grantee has failed to commence removal of the system or such part thereof as was des designated by city within 120 days after written notice of city's demand for removal is given, or if grantee has failed to complete such removal within 12 months after written notice of city's demand for removal is given, city shall have the right to declare all right, title, and interest to the system to be in the city with all rights of ownership, including but not limited to the right to operate the system or transfer the system to another for operation by it pursuant to the provisions of 47 U.S.C. Section 547. Subdivision 11, miscellaneous provision a force majeure. No, the party shall not be held in default under or in non-compliance with the provisions of the franchise or suffer any enforcement or penalty relating to non-compliance or default, including termination, cancellation, or revocation of the franchise where such non-compliance or alleged defaults occurred or were caused by strike, riot, war, earthquake, flood, tidal wave, unusually severe rain or snowstorm, hurricane, tornado, or other catastrophic act of nature, labor disputes, failure of utility service necessary to operate the cable system, governmental, administrative, or judicial order or regulation or other event that is reasonable beyond the grantee's ability to anticipate or control. This provision also covers work delays caused by waiting for utility providers to service or monitor their own utility pools on which the grantee's cable or equipment is attached, as well as unavailability of materials or qualified labor to perform the work necessary. B. Notice. All notices shall be in writing and shall be sufficiently given and served upon the other party by hand delivery, first class mail, registered or certified, return receipt requested, postage prepaid, or by reputable overnight courier service and addressed as follows to the grantor. City Manager, City of New Ulm, 100 North Broadway, New Ulm, Minnesota, 56073. The City Manager for the City of New Ulm, Minnesota shall be the officer that is responsible for the continuing administration of the franchise. With copies to Roger A. Chippert, New Ulm City Attorney, P.O. Box 214, New Ulm, Minnesota, 56073-0214. To the grantee, Comcast of, Ar of Arkansas, slash Florida, slash Louisiana slash Minnesota slash Mississippi slash Tennessee LLC, 10 River Park Plaza, St. Paul, Minnesota 55107, attention regional 
Regional Vice President as to Ordinance 17 019 to the grantee, Norm Telecom, Inc., 27 North Minnesota Street, Duwa, Minnesota. Attention, Kathy Lund. C. Severability. If any section, subsection, sentence, clause, phrase, or other portion of this franchise is for any reason declared invalid, in whole or in part, by any court, agency, commission, legislative body, or other authority of competent jurisdiction, such portion shall be deemed as a separate, distinct, and independent portion. Such declaration shall not affect the validity of the remaining portions hereof, which other portions shall continue in full force and effect. D. No waiver of rights. Nothing in this franchise shall be construed as a waiver of any rights, substantive or procedural, grantee may have under federal or state law unless such waiver is expressly stated herein. Subdivision 12, compliance with state and federal laws. Provisions of Minnesota state law that are required to be incorporated into this franchise and which are not otherwise already incorporated in this franchise are hereby specifically adopted and incorporated by reference. This includes, but is not limited to, the provisions of MinSTAT section 238.084. Notwithstanding any other provisions of this franchise, to the, con to the contrary, the grantee shall at all times comply with all state laws and rules regarding cable communications not later than one year after they become effective unless otherwise stated, and to conform to federal laws and regulations regarding cable as they become effective. Subdivision 13, liability and insurance. A grantee agrees by the acceptance of this franchise to indemnify and hold harmless grantor during the term of the franchise, and grantee shall maintain throughout the term of the franchise, liability insurance in an amount as grantor may require insuring both grantor and grantee with regard to damages and penalties that they may legally be required to pay as a result of the exercise of the franchise. B. Nothing contained in this agreement in franchise relieves a person from liability arising out of the failure to exercise reasonable care to avoid injuring grantees' facilities while performing work connected with grading, regrading, or changing a, the line of a street or public place or with the construction or reconstruction of a sewer or water system. Subdivision 14, CATV Advisory Board A. The City Council shall establish and appoint a CATV Advisory Board consisting of five members. The membership of said CAT Advisory Board shall consist of one city councilor who shall be appointed annually, one public utilities commissioner who shall be appointed annually, and three members of the general public who shall serve for three year terms. The members of the general public appointed to serve on the CAT advisory board shall be appointed to staggered terms such that not more than one term will expire in each calendar year. B. The CAT, the advisory board, shall advise the council on its regulatory jurisdiction and shall have the following responsibilities and duties. Small i. Monitor the performance of franchisee in executing the provisions of the franchise. Small ii. Advise the city council with regulation of subscriber charges pursuant to the requirements of this ordinance. Small iii. Advise the city council on matters which might constitute violations of this franchise and recommend appropriate action. Small IV, make recommendations to the City Council concerning rates and services to be offered. Small V, work with franchisee and any organization created pursuant to this ordinance to operate community access cable casting to encourage the use of community access services and to explore the fe feasibility of new services. Small VI, resolving disputes or disagreements between the subscribers and franchisees after an investigation should the subscriber and franchisee not first be able to resolve their view or disagreements, a decision or findings may be appealed to the City Council. Small VI, I, review and audit all reports and filings submitted to the City as required here under and such other other correspondences may be submitted to City concerning the operations of the CATV system and review the rules and regulations set by the franchise. Small VIII, assure that all tariffs, rates, and rules pertinent to the operation of the CATV system are made available for inspection by the public at reasonable hours and upon reasonable requests. Small IX, perform the periodic reviews and evaluations contemplated by Subdivision 7A-B hereof. Small X, such other responsibilities and duties as may from time to time be assigned to it by the Council. Subdivision 15, acceptance of franchise. This franchise and every extension or renewal thereof shall be accepted in writing by franchisee within 30 days after its passage by the City Council of City. And such acceptance shall be construed to be an acceptance of and consent to all of the terms, conditions, and limitations contained in this franchise and also all of the provisions of this charter. 
This franchise shall not be binding upon the city until accepted by franchisee as provided in this subdivision. Subdivision 16, this ordinance shall be in effect and in force 30 days after its passage, approval, and publication adopted by the City Council and City of Wall this blank day of blank 2017. Then Exhibit A, number one, City Offices at 100 North Broadway Street. Number two, Public Library at 17 North Broadway Street. Number three, Vogel Arena, Park and Rec Office at 122 South Garden Street. As to Ordinance 17-019, Exhibit A, Number one, City Offices at 100 North Broadway Street. Number two, Public Library at 17 North Broadway Street. Number three, Vogel Arena, Park and Rec Office at 122 South Garden Street. Exhibit B is Title 47, Telecommunication, Chapter 1, Federal Communications Commission, Subchapter C, Broadcast Radio Services, Part 76, Multi-Channel Video and Cable Television Service, Subpart H, General Operating Requirements, Section 76.309, Customer Service Obligations. A. The Cable Franchise Authority may enforce the customer service standards set forth in paragraph C of this section against cable operators. The Franchise Authority must provide affected cable operators 90 days written notice of its intent to enforce the standards. B. Nothing in this rule shall be construed to prevent or prohibit. Number one, a franchising authority and a cable operator from agreeing to customer service requirements that exceed the standards set forth in paragraph C of this section. Two, a franchising authority from enforcing through the end of the franchise term existing customer service requirements that exceed the standards set forth in paragraph C of this section and are contained in current franchise agreements. Three, any state or any franchising authority from enacting or enforcing any consumer protection law to the extent not specifically preempted herein or for the establishment or enforcement of any state or municipal law or regulation concerning customer service that imposes customer service requirements that exceed or address matters not addressed by the standards set forth in paragraph C of this section. C, Effective July 1, 1993, a cable operator shall be subject to the following customer service standards. Number one, cable system office hours and telephone availability. Small i. The cable operator will maintain a local toll-free or collect call telephone access line, which will be available to its subscribers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A. Trained company representatives will be available to respond to customer telephone inquiries during normal business hours. B. After normal business hours, the access line may be answered by a service or automated response system, including an answering machine. Inquiries received after normal business hours must be responded to by a trained company representative on the next business day. Small ii, under normal operating conditions, telephone answer time by a customer representative, including wait time, shall not exceed 30 seconds when the connection is made. If the call needs to be transferred, transfer time shall not exceed 30 seconds. These standards shall be met no less than 90% of the time under normal operating conditions measured on a quarterly basis. Small iii, the operator will not be required to acquire equipment or perform surveys to measure compliance with the telephone answering standards above unless it is in historical record of complaints indicates a clear failure to comply. IV, under normal operating conditions, the customer will receive a busy signal not less than 3% of the time. Small v, customer service center and bill payment locations will be open at least during normal business hours and will be conveniently located. Number two, installations, outages, and service calls. Under normal operating conditions, each of the following four standards will be met no less than 95% of the time measured on a quarterly basis. Small i, standard installation will be performed within seven business days after an order has been placed. Standard installations are those that are located up to 125 feet from the existing distribution system. II, excluding conditions beyond the control of the operator, the cable operator will begin working on service interruptions promptly at an no event later than 24 hours after the interruption becomes known. The cable operator must begin actions to correct other service problems the next business day after notification of the service problem. III, the appointment of window alternatives for installation, service calls, and other installation activities will be either a specific time or at a maximum of four hour time block during normal business hours. The operator may schedule service calls and other installation activities outside of normal business hours for the express convenience of the customer. IV, an operator may not cancel an appointment with a customer after the close of business on the business day prior to the scheduled appointment. V, if a 
If a cable operator representative is running late for an appointment with the customer and will not be able to keep the appointment as scheduled, the customer will be contacted. The appointment will be rescheduled as necessary at a time which is convenient for the customer. Three, communications between cable operators and cable subscribers. I, refunds. Refund checks will be issued promptly, but no later than either A, the customer's next billing cycle following resolution of the request or 30 days, whichever is earlier, or B, the return of the equipment supplied by the cable operator if service is terminated. II credits. Credits for service will be issued no later than the customer's next billing cycle following the determination that a credit is warranted. For definitions, normal business hours. The term normal business hours means those hours during which most similar businesses in the community are open to serve customers. In all cases, normal business hours must include some evening hours at least one night per week and or some weekend hours, II. Normal operating conditions. The term normal operating conditions means those service conditions which are within the control of the cable operator. Those conditions which are not within the control of the cable operator include, but are not limited to, natural disasters, civil disturbances, power outages, telephone network outages, and severe and unusual weather conditions. Those conditions which are ordinarily within the control of the cable operator include, but are not limited to, special promotions, pay-per-view events, rate increases, regular peak or seasonal demand periods and maintenance or upgrade of the cable system, III. Service interruption, the term service interruption means the loss of picture or sound on one or more cable channels. And that concludes the reading of ordinance numbers 17018 and 17019.